Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and if you haven't seen me before, my name is Ava and I'm a PhD student from UCL. So during this video, I'm going to talk about ways to reduce anxiety and stress during COVID and day-to-day -day life. I'm going to look at how we can address uncertainty and lack of control we may feel in terms of biological perspective as well as psychological. And I'm also going to talk about physical symptoms such as exercise, sleep and diet and other factors which are important for our mental health. If you want to know specifically the four different factors I'm going to talk about, I'm also going to timestamp each section so you can skip to one that you think will be more relevant to you. But for every factor I mention, I'm going to give a bit of biology and psychology behind it. So firstly, I'm going to talk about uncertainty and feeling like you lack control of your environment. I'm going to talk about this in terms of locus of control and how individuals can be on a spectrum where they may have an internal locus of control or external. So example of external locuses of control could be believing that your achievements are due to other people, due to the environment around you, due to destiny or fate and other forces that are outside of your control. And those with an internal sense of control believe that their achievements are due to their own actions and ability. So this is more of a spectrum where individuals may not be completely internal or completely external in their locus of control. And we're trying to explain here why it's important to be more on the internal locus control side of the spectrum. So one study that reviewed 21 studies found that 18 of them had significant results that suggested that those with an external locus of control were more likely to have higher anxiety levels. Also, research has suggested that those with an internal locus of control are more likely to address problem solving and coping strategies that successfully reduce anxiety. From a biological perspective, results have suggested that individuals with an external locus of control have increased activity in the connection between the amygdala, which results in fear, and the medial prefrontal cortex, which is related to decision making. So the hippocampus is the part of the brain that regulates emotion as well as being involved in working memory and the ability to recall emotional memories. It's been found that if you have high stress or anxiety levels that causes chronic release of the stress hormone cortisol, this actually has toxic effects on the hippocampus, suggesting that high cortisol means a reduction in the hippocampal volume. Another study that stimulated the stressful environment found that individuals were better able to control the stressor and also reduce their cortisol level, which is a stress hormone produced in your body, when they had an internal locus control. So this just shows a biological link not only with the stress hormone, but also volumes of your brain, and now having an internal locus of control might mediate that effect. Now that I've spoken about the biological mechanisms that are related to locus of control, I'm now going to talk about a few strategies that we can use in our day to day life. So one way we can do this is by rephrasing common thoughts that we might have when we're feeling out of control in our situations. So an example of this would be when you think there is nothing I can do, you suggest thinking, well, there are some things I can do and there's always an alternative. Another example would be when someone makes you feel angry, you can think about how you may not be able to control their actions, but you can control how you feel and react to them. Another way that we can think about changing our locus and control to be more internal is by thinking about the specific things that we feel give us stress in our lives. So having a list, we can write down the things that we can control and the things that we directly cannot control. And then we think about how we can maintain, reinforce or strengthen what we can control and ways that we can deal, accept or embrace what we can't. Another way that we can reduce our anxiety and stress levels is by positively reframing our thoughts. So this basically means trying to find the positive in a difficult situation. So this could be thinking about the lessons that we've learned from it or the lessons we've learned from mistakes we specifically made. Or it could be thinking about the opportunities that were gained from having this difficult situation. An example would be missing social interaction during the pandemic. So maybe instead you'll think about how you didn't used to value these things so much beforehand and now you finally see the value in them more so than you did before. Or you could think about the opportunities that it has given you. This could be having an increased time for more hobbies that you weren't going to consider beforehand. Positive reframing can be important for both depression and anxiety, but the reason why I'm talking about it now is because it's particularly relevant to people who would be considered perfectionists. And these are people who would set themselves very high, unachievable goals and then feel disappointed when they don't quite reach them. One study that compared perfectionists versus those who were not considered perfectionists found that those who were perfectionists had higher self-blame, lower self-esteem, and also more dissatisfaction at the end of the day 
When they introduced positive reframing as a coping strategy, this was effective for both perfectionists and non-perfectionists, but additional analysis found that perfectionists actually appreciated this coping strategy more, and it helped them feel less dissatisfied at the end of the day, and feel more satisfied at the goals that they were able to achieve. One of the primary medications that is given to individuals with generalized anxiety disorder are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and this increases the serotonin levels that are released in the brain. Considering that SSRIs are one of the first lines of treatments for people with anxiety disorder, it's important to know that the delay that can be seen when starting an SSRI in terms of how it changes anxiety levels may actually be due to this cognitive positive reframing. So this means framing things from a more positive outlook was actually a mediating factor that affected whether these SSRIs were actually effective. So hopefully this shows how positive reframing is related to serotonin and therefore can reduce anxiety levels. It's also important to consider that cognitive behaviour therapy is one of the first line therapeutic treatments for individuals with anxiety disorder and that specifically looks at positive reframing techniques. I know it's easy to say that positive thinking should be endorsed more, especially with people with anxiety and depression. However, it's really important to try and challenge your thoughts that you might have on a daily basis. So take a minute when you think negatively to think about the positives in that situation and know that that might actually have a chronic and biological effect on your mental health long term. So now I'm going to talk more about strategies that we can do to feel more in control. So one of these is the actions we take day to day. So it's important to feel a sense of normalcy, even if it seems like a temporary new normal at the moment. So this means developing a routine which has some activities that were relevant to how uh, you kind of performed on a day-to-day -day basis before COVID, as well as maybe having some new activities that you have to look forward to. So this could be new ways of enjoying your life that you haven't considered, such as dancing, singing, yoga, book club, crafts, exercise, gardening, reading, watching films, reading books, playing instruments, drawing, painting, learning a new language, writing poetry. As you can see, there are a lot of hobbies that we can choose from and we can definitely fill our day without having to think specifically about the pandemic all the time. This means that when we feel overwhelming anxiety, we can take action on it in an active way by doing something that reduces our ability to feel like it's an overwhelming feeling. Although it might also seem quite easy to just think about hobbies and think, well, I, maybe I don't feel like doing this, but I think it's also important to see what you value in your day as this will be a tailored routine for each person. So now I'm briefly going to talk about the 10 different values that we might have and how you could implement this to have a more personalized approach to tailoring your routine. So you can either write this down or you can just read it off the screen and think about things that are important to you within that value. So you might value one thing more than another and it's important that you create your own list of values in your whole life and try and make this as comprehensive as possible so that it's related not just to your social life but also to your academic and employment, physical and mental health. Once you've written a list such as like one that I've done already, you can then think about how you can implement activities that relate to the values that you see as important. So here I've suggested some examples of things that you might find valuable. So this is just an example of how you would implement it in your daily life. And then here you can see the kind of activities that I could do on a day to day basis that would make me feel like I'm achieving these goals in an achievable way, reducing my anxiety levels on things that I might have low self esteem or belief in myself about but also giving myself achievable goals that make me feel satisfied with what I've done in my day. Some of the things that we can control at the moment are when we sleep, when we eat, and when we go out for a daily walk. I know this seems like things that we might take for granted because they're a necessity and a basic need in our life, but it's also important to think that those are things that we can still control and how maybe we could moderate this to be more exciting during the day, such as what new dish can we try out or what different route can we take when we're going out for our daily walk. Another thing we can control as well is how much we abide by the rules. So knowing that we're abiding by the rules that society have given us, such as social distancing and washing hands, can actually make us feel like we are a valued part of society and we're contributing to a bigger thing, which is the mental and physical health of everyone around us. It's also not just important to think about how our little actions can actually have an impact on societal guidelines, but it's also important to think about how we can control the amount of news and media that we read on a daily basis. So I think a lot of the time some people may feel anxiety due to the amount of COVID related news that is out there. However, you can control how much you really expose yourself to that. This might be by deleting all of the news apps that you have on your phone and only looking at the news for a specific amount of time every day. 
So obviously the amount of days, minutes, hours, seconds that you spend looking at the news will really be different to different people. So it's about being able to manage it and feeling like you have a control over it so that it doesn't increase your anxiety levels to an overwhelming state. It's also important to consider that while we might not be able to control the actions of others around us, we can actually still control our own and that's what we should be focusing on. So if you feel anxious about the behaviours of others when you go out to the supermarket, then maybe go out during a time when there are less people. So now I'm going to talk about how we can control our diet, sleep and exercise, as well as the biological effects that these have on anxiety. Firstly, let's talk about the biological implications of sleep. One study found that even having partial sleep deprivation increased cortisol levels in the blood the next day. And this suggests that even with partial sleep deprivation, our ability to be resilient to stress is reduced. It's also a cyclical thing, whereby having insomnia or reduced or lacking sleep increases the risk of you developing an anxiety disorder. And also having an anxiety disorder can also facilitate symptoms of insomnia. It's also important to consider the link between insomnia or sleep disturbance and anxiety levels because a lot of the cognitive behaviour therapy that targets anxiety is related to the cognitive behaviour therapy that targets people with insomnia. And the fact that there are similarities between these therapies suggests a link also between insomnia and anxiety. It's also been found in research that individuals with insomnia or reduced sleep showed less of a response to SSRIs for depression and anxiety. So not only does it affect the symptoms you have, but it also might reduce the effectiveness of biological treatment. So this just emphasises the need that we have for a routine in our day so that we sleep and wake up at similar times consistently, making sure we have plenty of sleep so that the next day we feel more rejuvenated, uh, we have more serotonin in our brain and we can think more positively about the daily events. In terms of diet, I have explained in a previous depression treatment video that the gut bacteria we have actually synthesizes and processes 90% of the serotonin in our body. And that just shows that the diet and thing that we eat really does affect the amount of serotonin we have in our brain. As you know, serotonin is considered the happy neurotransmitter in our brain and allows us to think more positively and shows links with reduced anxiety. Research suggests that the more Mediterranean your diet is, such as having more fruit and vegetables compared to having more of a westernized diet, such as having saturated, processed, fatty foods, is actually more beneficial to your gut and would maybe synthesize more serotonin in your brain. And the last physical strategy is exercise. Now, exercise has a lot of different effects to anxiety in terms of biological pathways. But briefly, I'm going to talk about the psychological effects of how exercise might help reduce anxiety levels. So one of the reasons you may be apprehensive to start doing some exercise is not just due to lack of motivation, but your need to avoid situations where you may feel physical sensations that you relate to your anxiety. However, this can be seen as a sort of exposure therapy. Research suggests that individuals who have high anxiety levels and expose themselves to exercise actually have more of a tolerance to their anxiety symptoms due to their exposure to similar symptoms during exercise, such as increased heart rate. So this exposure makes us realise that these physiological sensations may be uncomfortable, but they shouldn't be interpreted as a sign of threat. Individuals who believe that they can actually manage potential threats are not plagued by worry and have reduced anxiety levels. So having this exposure to physical symptoms and then reducing the feeling of threat you might feel from them means that you might increase your confidence in being able to manage potential threats in the future. Also, we increase our confidence because we can control the amount of exercise we do and having this sense of control over the feelings that we might have can give us the ability to manage them in the future. As our fitness improves, we have greater duration capability, greater endurance and less pain. Research also suggests that exercise can actually be more effective at reducing anxiety levels than distraction techniques given in therapy. Reviewing literature on different exercise interventions suggests that the amount of exercise that we should do that will be most effective for anxiety levels would be having rhythmic aerobic exercise that focuses on large muscle groups such as running or cycling and also doing it for three times a week for a 10 week period at least. While this is the most effective way to reduce our anxiety, there has been shown to be effectiveness from exercise just from one session. And this suggests that the effect really can be instant and you might be able to feel that satisfaction and that reduction in your anxiety levels straight after one. 
In terms of the biological effects of exercise, when you exercise, you actually have more serotonin in your brain. Thinking about this exposure idea to the sensations you may feel during an anxiety attack relates a lot to research that looked at rats on a exercise wheel. They found that when rats were on an exercise wheel, they showed increased serotonin in an area of the brain that's usually abundant in serotonin during a stressful event. So this shows that a small amount of serotonin in this area related to anxiety during exercise can help you better tolerate the symptoms later on. Also, the reduced pain and euphoric effect you might feel after exercise are due to the release of endorphins that are related to the central nervous system. So when you think back at what I said earlier about how high anxiety levels could be linked to having a reduced hippocampal volume due to the stress response that we have in our brain, it's been found that exercise has actually increased neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which basically means our ability to form new connections between neurons. Now that I've spoken more about the physical activities that we can do to reduce our anxiety, I'm going to go back to a more psychological approach, which is being more compassionate with yourself. And now I'm going to talk specifically about how being self-compassionate actually relates to our anxiety levels. While mindfulness is an important strategy that we should consider in our day-to-day -day life, especially relating to depression and anxiety, one study actually found that self-compassion had 10 times more ability to predict life quality as well as symptoms of anxiety compared to mindfulness. Biologically, it's been found that individuals who had higher sense of self-compassion actually showed reduced biological response to stress. That is, those who had high self-compassion have reduced systolic blood pressure and cortisol levels. Also, having higher compassion for others means that we're more likely to build social relationships with others and therefore have a better ability to inform coping strategies. So now I'm just going to show a few slides that relate to self-compassion from an ACT view. ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy and is considered a third wave therapy just like mindfulness is. Self-esteem tends to be contingent on perceived competence in various life domains, meaning that it's unstable, fluctuating up and down according to your latest successes and failures. However, self-compassion is not based on positive judgments or evaluations. It is a way of positively relating to ourselves. Self-compassion means that you're positive to yourself regardless of the goals you believe that you need to achieve. Most of us, our default mode is when we are suffering is to turn away from our pain as fast as possible, such as avoiding it, denying it, trying to escape it, suppressing it or being distracted from it. All too often, the things we do to escape are not actually kind or caring. If you think about it, if you wanted to be compassionate to someone you love who comes to you in great pain, tells you how much they're suffering, you wouldn't immediately try to distract them. If this was your first response, you'd come across as uncaring and inconsiderate. If you wanted to come across as compassionate, your first response would be to acknowledge in a kind and caring voice how difficult and painful that is. Secondly, we respond with kindness. And one idea is by having a skill of kind self-talk. We tend to unhook ourselves from these harsh self-judgments and not good enough stories when they show up. We can learn how to take the power out of them and let them come and stay and then go without getting caught up in them or pushed around by these feelings. For example, if you've made a mistake in some way, perhaps remind yourself that you're human, that you are fallible and everyone makes mistakes and no one is perfect. All too often when we are in great pain, we try to invalidate our own emotional experience. We judge our pain as abnormal or unnatural or a sign there is something wrong with us. Our mind tells us that we shouldn't feel like this, we shouldn't react like this, we should be able to handle it better. Often our mind belittles us and tells us we are overreacting or weak or we have nothing to complain about because we compare ourselves to someone else. We remind ourselves that it is normal and natural for humans to have painful thoughts and feelings when life is difficult. When we make mistakes, when we get rejected or when we experience any kind of reality gap. And if our minds compare our emotional reactions unfavorably to those of others, we can remind ourselves that we are unique. Your pain tells you that you have a heart, that you care deeply, that some people really matter to you. Your pain tells you that you are facing a reality gap. Pain is what every living, caring human being feels whenever they meet a reality gap. And the bigger that reality gap, the greater pain that arises. So your pain is not a sign of weakness or defectiveness or mental illness. It's a sign you are a living, caring human being. It's something you have in common with every living thing on the planet. So hopefully this gave you an understanding as to what self-compassion is and ways that we can talk to ourselves or acknowledge the pain that we might be feeling. This also might help us when we feel we are not good enough or there are negative connotations to not meeting an achievement or a goal due to our anxiety levels. 
And lastly, something that I briefly mentioned in my depression COVID video was feeling valued. We all need to feel valued in some way and doing that could help us increase our self-esteem and therefore reduce our anxiety levels. One way this was done before COVID was social prescribing. And this was basically finding individuals who might feel isolated, such as elderly patients, and actually prescribing them a social group where they can teach a skill to a younger person, such as gardening. They found that individuals who were isolated and then were put in the group showed reduced depression and anxiety levels because they felt they were valued by someone specifically. So I think it's important to consider a way that you feel you can help others or feel valued by someone virtually in this day-to-day -day era. This could simply be just from teaching something to a friend that they didn't know, teaching a colleague at work how to do something they didn't know before, or just being there for a friend who feels lonely at this time. This can increase our sense of self-value and reduce our anxiety levels as we feel we don't have to have unachievable goals in order to feel that self-esteem. So even if you really can't think of anything that makes you feel valued, even just not talking to anyone, it's important to know that even just by staying at home, you are actually providing a positive and beneficial effect to society. So hopefully you found this useful and relatable. If you have any questions, then please comment below. If you have any ideas for future videos, then please comment below as well. If you feel like you're suffering from some sort of sadness or depressive symptom, then also you can look at my other video relating to COVID that focuses more on depressive symptoms. Thank you very much and I hope to see you next week.